a little bit. What you need? No, I was just, I, I didn't, Curious. It didn't, it didn't process that you were talking into that side. Saw and heard at the same time. Oh, we're still recording. You want to say anything? Hey. Our first ever Capstone Youth video blog. You have made it. Congratulations. You got the link. In case you missed it, we're going to be doing these over the next couple of weeks, uh, or well, really for the foreseeable future until we are able to meet back in person, just because I know I still love interacting with you guys in some way. I know I still love teaching you guys the things that I feel like the Lord's taught me. And we want to challenge you guys to continue to grow even in you know, pretty unusual times for us. You know, God is not a God who is just faithful to us when it's convenient for him and when things are going great and, you know, everything's according to plan. Uh, you know, he has continually showed his faithfulness to us uh, no matter the circumstance, no matter the cost. And so we want to encourage you guys, uh, we want to encourage ourselves to be a people who will continue to be faithful to him no matter the circumstance, no matter the convenience for us and things like that. And so... We are starting this video blog in an effort to do that. So basically, it'll just be uh, a few words from me, uh, similar to maybe what we would normally do on Wednesday nights. So in a few minutes, we'll get back into the book of Isaiah, what we've been studying. And then there'll be some discussion questions at the end. We would encourage you guys, you can either text me, your small group leaders, David, uh, Becky, Paige, uh, Grace or Emily, they would all love to talk to you guys, still still communicate with you guys. Or if you uh, have the opportunity to watch the watch these videos with your parents, uh, that would be great as well. You can discuss some of the things that are going on well and give you guys an opportunity to really kind of connect uh, about spiritual things, spiritual topics with your family, which would be a really great win for us in this time. Uh, as we said earlier, if you guys spend 15 hours a day playing Fortnite for the next few weeks, that is not going to be the best use of this opportunity you have. But if you take some time and continue to grow, continue to learn more about the Lord, continue to deepen your love for him uh, and understand his really, really deep love for you, that is a huge win. So before we jump in, I wanted to let you guys know as well that our thing that we are going to be trying to do is Zoom video chats on our normal times Wednesday nights. So boys, we will send out the link for you, but you will be me and David. Be with me and David, I should say. Uh, at 6 p.m. on the Zoom chat, and then girls, you will be with Grace and Emily at least uh, at 7 p.m. on a Zoom chat. So parents and students, I will send out that information through email, through text, uh, and if you still haven't gotten it, then please contact me directly, and we can get you hooked up with those so you guys can have the opportunity to not only just listen to me, but then also have the chance to interact and talk and catch up with your friends that you're not seeing, catch up with some of the leaders that I hope you guys are uh, looking forward to see and still connect with over this time. So be on the lookout for that. The first one will be March 25th, uh, and we will be good to go and start rolling on that. So without further ado, let's dig back into the book of Isaiah. So as you guys may remember, uh, the last time we spoke, we talked about a guy named King Hezekiah, who did some really good things in his life, in fairness. Uh, you may remember from Isaiah, roughly about 36, uh, there was a cry from the prophet Isaiah uh, that the land, the tribe of Judah and Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And so King Hezekiah actually led the people into repentance, led the people uh, into literal sackcloth and ashes uh, to say, Lord, no, we turn back to you. Please keep this disaster from happening. Uh, keep the Assyrians from coming to destroy all of us. And the Lord did it. The Lord was faithful, uh, and he delivered the people. But then, unfortunately, we see somewhere around chapter 39, uh, Hezekiah actually invites in a very powerful nation, the nation of Babylon, to basically see uh, everything that Jerusalem had to offer. You know, all the riches that they may have accumulated, their weak spots, their, you know, strongholds, things like that, uh, and made uh, the city of Jerusalem and the tribe of Judah very vulnerable to attack. And so uh, Isaiah says, why have you done this? This was a really bad idea. Now Babylon is actually going to come and destroy uh, the tribe of Judah and then uh, the city in Jerusalem. And Hezekiah's response is basically something extended of like, ah, oh, that's fine. I won't be alive to see it. So that's those guys' problem, uh, which obviously is an incredibly selfish response, something that is not 
uh, at all uh, what we would strive to be as I mean, not all what the Lord does for us uh, as he calls us to be selfless servants uh, and that's not what Hezekiah exemplifies there uh, but that's where we are so we're picking back up and the people have just been told that their city, their livelihoods, and everything like that is at stake. Uh, everything's going to be destroyed by the nation of Babylon. And so when we think back to uh, or where these people were, I should say, uh, under King David, uh, they were the highest to high, the most powerful nation. God's favor clearly upon them, right? Everything going right for these people. Uh, and then now we see a few hundred years later uh, that they're going to be completely destroyed. They're going to be wiped out. They're going to be led into exile by the nation of Babylon. And what a far fall that is for these people and how difficult that is for them to understand. Because think about, you know, if you were the favorite, if you were the best, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, it was taken away from you. Maybe you, know, you think about a professional athlete or you think about something like that, you know, uh, where, you know, they're doing great and then, you know, they're a great pitcher, blow out the elbow, you know, great point guard, blow out the knee, uh, tear the ACL. And they aren't, you know, at this high status that they were anymore. And it's really easy to lose a magical four-letter word called hope. And these people really would have been struggling for hope at this moment to think, wow, like we were completely like God's favorite people, um, God's chosen people, I should say. Uh, and then now we're going to be completely destroyed by outsiders, through people who don't even seem to worship the Lord, who don't even seem to honor the Lord. And so how do we make sense of that? Uh, how do we find hope in the most desolate of places, in the most desperate of places? Well, luckily for them, uh, there's answers to that. And it starts in Isaiah chapter 49. And so Isaiah is saying that hope is going to come, but it's not going to be in the form that you may expect. You see, uh, the Lord is going to send uh, someone who refers to as the servant of the Lord. And he's going to come and he's going to restore uh, the tribe of Judah, uh, the nation of Israel, back to its former glory, Isaiah says. And so this would have been great news. This would have been great hope. I'm going to read from Isaiah 49 and verse 8. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritage. Saying to the prisoners, come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water he will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highway shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sion. In verse 13, sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. And so, this guy, the servant of the Lord, is going to come and he is going to deliver the people, right? All right. He's going to say, you know, everything is going to be restored. Everything's going to be back to where you guys are in relationship with me, uh, with God. And so, everything is going to be back to the way it was. However, if we keep reading, we understand that this is actually going to be something different than what we were expecting. Because you have to remember, like we said, the highest of highs for these people in Israel was King David, this great, powerful, vocal military leader. And so this would have been pretty easy to see that the people will assume that's who was coming as well. The servant of the Lord was going to be somebody who's going to be this great person who's going to lead Israel into battle. Maybe they're going to defeat the nation of Babylon. Maybe they're going to defeat the Assyrians or whoever's going to come about and things like that. All these world powers. And they're going to restore order through these military battles, through this you know, political justice and things like that. But that's not at all what the Lord reveals that his servant is going to be. Instead, if we flip over to Isaiah chapter 52, and we'll start reading in verse 13, the Bible says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations, for kings shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told to them, they see. That which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up, the servant, before him like a plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. And so we see the servant of the Lord coming isn't going to be this great and powerful king. And the Bible says there's nothing that we would have esteemed about him, nothing that we would have said, wow, what a magical person. What a great, unbelievable person, you know. When you think about even the descriptions a king saw in Scripture, you know, he was a head taller than other people. You know, he was somebody who had been, you know, looked very impressive when he walked up. You know, there's the old joke about, you know, you want the big guy to get off the bus first on the football team because the other team gets scared when they see how big this guy is. You know, we want this physically impressive guy who's going to come forward and bring this power but instead the servant of the lord is going to be exactly that he's going to be a servant he's going to be somebody who's going to be ripped up chewed out beat up beaten up by the people who he's actually coming to save and remember this is about 600 years before christ comes in the time of isaiah and so we have to remember they wouldn't have really had the idea that we have of the picture of Jesus. They wouldn't have had the Gospels, the descriptions of who Jesus was, right? But who does this sound like to us? You know, we'll read again. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Well, we remember Jesus on the cross. He was smitten and stricken. And he was beaten and crucified for our iniquities or for our sin. And so this description makes a lot of sense to us when we think, wow, that sounds familiar. This is Jesus, right? And it is. This is a prophetic telling by Isaiah that the servant of the Lord or Jesus is coming. But you're not going to find him in a great and powerful king. No, your hope's going to come actually in a man that's going to be beaten and mistreated and abused and actually killed. This is going to be the person who brings you peace. It's not going to be another King David who comes. And so it makes a lot of sense to us why Jesus was so misunderstood. Because the people would have thought this great powerful king's coming to bring the nation of Israel back. But instead, what Isaiah says is like, no, this servant of the Lord is going to humble himself and serve and give his life as a ransom for those who he came to save. And so a couple of the big things that we see uh, is that Jesus is better than what we think that we need. You see, the people in Israel, the people in Judah, the uh, Isaiah was talking to, they would have thought, yeah, this great military king will bring us back to power, but God knows what the people need because they have bigger problems than the Babylonians coming and taking their land. They do. Sounds crazy, you know, somebody's going to remove you from your land, take away your house, take away all your belongings. Like, what could be worse than that? Well, throughout the Bible, we continually see something that corrupts and literally kills. The wages of it is death. Continually, continually, we see this description throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And of course, the thing I'm talking about is sin. You see, as great as King David was, or as great as any king has ever been in all history, they couldn't do anything about sin. And ultimately, sin is what continually brings about death and hurting and pain into the world. And so, what humanity actually needs isn't this great king. They need somebody who can fix their sin problem. And so King Jesus comes, but he comes in the form of a servant because that's exactly what we need. Remember the gospel message that we were in perfect fellowship with God, but then sin separates us. 
And there's nothing we can do to bridge this divide. But Jesus has come to die the death that we should die, to pay the debt of sin that we should owe, and ultimately defeat the grave. So instead of being stuck in sin and death, we can have life and life in his name because Jesus brings about new life in his resurrection. You see, this is actually what we need, right? This is the hope that the people need. They just don't realize that they need it. And so how much better is God than the things that we think that we want? There's no money. There's no status. There's no great spouse for us one day. There's no great job for us one day. Great house. Really awesome boat. Whatever it is that you think may bring you life. It can't because it cannot do anything to fix your sin problem. And so the ultimate source of hope is someone who can remove sin or iniquities from the people. And that only hope, of course, is found, Isaiah describes, in Jesus. The second thing that we see is that Jesus is where all our needs are met. Not only is there our greatest hope, he's where all your greatest needs are met. Because once you understand that your sin is paid for, once you understand that death no longer has a hold on you, these are your greatest needs in life. And so it gives you freedom to hope. Everything within reason that you had to worry about is taken care of. Now, of course, you know, some of you, you know, are still saying, well, there's still bills to pay. There's still, you know, food to eat. You know, there's things like that we have to find out. Okay. But at the end of the day, you know that you are continually and always connected back with your Heavenly Father because of what Jesus has done for you. That's the greatest hope there is. And that's the greatest need that we have to be reunited with the Father and to find life that He originally gave us in the beginning. Life that is resurrected in Jesus, in His name. There's no other source of life. There's no other way for that need to be met because there's no other fix for sin. We see throughout the Old Testament, we've seen through the story of the nation of Israel, they continually have these leaders where you want to go with Moses or Joshua or David or some of these famous ones that we know, Solomon, whoever else, and they continually fail, continually fail, continually fail. Because as great as those guys might have been, they couldn't do anything for the nation's sin problem. And more importantly, they couldn't do anything about their own sin problem. And so we see that Jesus is the true place where actually hope comes about. The gospel is the only true source of hope. That's what Isaiah is telling the people. And that message is still true for us today. There's no other source of hope that we should look for than Christ. Because Jesus provides for our greatest needs by giving us life and life in his name. So we are not stuck continually in this cycle of sin and death that we always bring about when we rely on ourselves, when we rely on our own power. And so how awesome is that and how greatly is God to be praised? That he provides us hope and he provides for our needs. And so here are a few questions I want to challenge you guys to think about. Here's some things that, you know, just take some time. Like I said, text your small group leaders, text me, you know, get in contact with them or talk about them with your parents. And we'll put these up at the end of the video as well. So you guys can take a screenshot of it or you can pause the video and take a picture of it, write them down, whatever it is. But here are some questions I think are really good for us to think about in light of this message of the servant of the Lord coming. And so let's think about these. What are some things in life that give you hope? What are some things in life that give you hope, you know? If I'm being honest, you know, my wife gives me hope. You know, I know that I come home and I have somebody that loves me. These different things that give us hope. I mean, it can be sports. It can be anything like that. They naturally give us hope. And they can be used for good things. But unfortunately, if they become idols for us, if they become greater sources of hope for us than what the gospel is, then it can be a really detrimental thing. We can think that they matter too much for us. But what are some things really that just bring you about, bring you to a place where you say, you know what? Things are going to be okay. Things that say, you know what? This really makes me happy. What are some things about that? But the second question, how does Jesus give us hope? And how is that hope different than these other sources? So for me, what are the ways that Jesus is different? 
And his love is different than the love that I have for my wife and that she has for me. Maybe there are some things that compare, but what are the differences? Obviously, we talked about it for a, a long time back in uh, the first part of the video. But at the same point, we have to realize that Jesus' hope and the hope that he brings is greater and really the only true source of hope that we can have. Question number three, when do believers have this hope? When they have hope, is it circumstantial? Do they have it always, sometimes, when they're being faithful? When is the hope of the gospel true in your life? Number four, how should we respond in light of what Jesus has done for us? So, very practically, I'll help you out on this one because this goes along with question number five. Jesus brings us hope and Jesus provides for our needs. So question five, what are some ways that you can share hope and provide for people this week? Which I know, obviously, we're all stuck at home. But what are some ways that we can share hope with people and provide for people's needs? We have to realize that there's a lot of people in the world that are really, really scared of this. Really scared of COVID-19 or coronavirus or whatever you want to call it. These things that are going around in the world. What are some ways that we can be an encouragement, that we can be the lie of the world that Jesus has called us to be? Because God is a God who brings hope in Jesus, the servant of the Lord. And therefore, his people should go out and send that hope as well. Should be deliverers of hope continually, no matter the circumstance. You know why? Because Jesus has conquered death. Jesus is eternal. Jesus' hope lasts forever, no matter the circumstance. And so what are some ways that you can share hope? Maybe it's writing a letter to somebody that can't get out much. Grandparents, some of these people who are a little bit more uh, at risk to getting this virus that really can't go outside. They're really, you know, there's a lot of danger for them. How can we share hope? Maybe it's writing a card to them just saying, hey, I'm thinking about it. Maybe it's calling them, FaceTime them, whatever else, praying for them. There are all these different ways that we can share hope. It's like, hey, God loves you and I love you. What beautiful hope that can bring. What are some ways that you can provide for people? Obviously, some of you guys may be getting a little tired of your families, your siblings, your parents. If they're being honest, they may be getting a little tired of you as well. But at the same point, what an opportunity for us to continually to serve one another, to provide for one another, to not waste our entire days playing video games on TikTok, whatever else. Just wasting our hours. Instead, we can spend time with those who we are closest with, those who we love the most. So instead of you know playing Fortnite for 12 hours today, why don't you play a board game with your family? That sounds silly. That sounds corny. Maybe a little bit, but it's also going to build a relationship with your family. When we give people our time, when we give people our energy, that's one of the most tangible ways, that's one of the most practical ways that they can see that we actually love and care about them. No matter the circumstance, invite your siblings to do what you are doing with them, particularly if you're an older sibling. Your younger siblings are continually looking up to you, looking at you as an example. And how much does it mean when you invite them in and you say, hey, can you hang out with me? Let's do this together. Let's have some fun. What an awesome way that could be. Maybe it's just, you know, getting up on time, doing your schoolwork on time when your parents ask you. So they'll have to ask you 17 times. Doing the things and being obedient to them as this is a difficult time for them as well. There are all these different ways that we can serve and provide for the people that we're closest with. And so, again, we're going to put these questions up for you guys to discuss. We're going to put them up. Uh, for you guys just to talk about, think about, and whatever else. And we hope that you guys take the time to think about what it means that the servant of the Lord has come to give us hope and to provide for our needs. Again, just so you guys know, if you need me, if I can do anything for you in this time, we're going to keep putting out more video blogs. We're going to keep doing everything else. But if I can do anything for you, man, just reach out to me, all right? If you need to know how to get in contact with me, your parents should know. Or if not, you can email me, andrew at capstonechurch.com. And I can get you my other contact information. It'll be great. I would love to hear from you guys. I'd love to catch up with you. I'd love to hear you know, how you guys are continuing to serve and be faithful in this time. And so hit me up this week. Uh, talk to your small group leaders. Uh, continue to love and serve your families around you. 
and then uh, just be safe, be well. We love you guys. I'm really excited uh, to continue to be able to share with you guys uh, and hope to hear from you guys soon. See you guys.